St. Paul, the fan. Sierra Nevada Brewing Company brings us Nacho Lieber, Ben Lieber, via the Connecticut Water Systems hotline. Um, it's been a, a very an intensive football hour. We had Kevin Seifert in studio the last couple segments. I will start with the same question I asked him. What happened last night? <laughs> Boy, Dan, I wish I knew what happened last night. That was that was something that I was not expecting. Look, I, I knew that after watching uh, the week before, I saw this Denver defense and the way that they manipulate their safeties, especially when we're trying to figure out if we're in man coverage or zone coverage with all of our motions and stuff like that. It did really confuse Dobbs and what he wanted to do and the, and the processing speed and all that stuff post-snap. So I figured that there would be some sort of adjustment being made, like, okay, if the Bears do something similar, we're going to look a little bit different. But what we saw yesterday was nothing that I expected. And, um, you know, Dobbs really looked like he was scrambling, yeah. you know, mentally, yeah. just trying to figure out. And he was overthinking things. Just uh, he, he felt very unsure about what he was seeing. And you saw that with some of the late deliveries on some of those passes that got tipped and, and knocked out through the air and intercepted. Yeah, I, I'm, it's interesting because I, I'm uh, the strong message I've gotten from fans, and maybe this is human nature, is they don't want to put any of this on Dobbs. They they want to put it on play calling. Uh, we forgot that he's uh, he's he's good rolling out. We forgot the things that are his strengths. And I'm here to talk about all of that. I I don't know that it was a perfectly called game. I think Seifert and I agree. Uh, we'd like to see more runs when you, especially with a quarterback who isn't really, I think, uh, capable of th- you know flinging the ball 52 times a game week after week. But I think uh, some of this is on what you discussed too, because I'm hearing uh, the only interception that was trailing Hobbs on, on uh, Dobbs was the first one. Others were catchable balls. KOC only rolled him out once, which is a strong point. Should have been rolling him out with run pass options like a waggle. I, I know that he just loves that waggle term. We all do. And, and I, I'm curious to get your view on it because I think a lot of it simply was Dobbs had a bad game. I, I And I think he did, did get overwhelmed a few times. He made some bad decisions. He threw late. Looked to me like he was kind of frazzled. And not so much necessarily that we weren't rolling them out every time we had the opportunity to do it. Well, that is the, that is the interesting thing about him rolling out is I don't expect that KOC is going to take his whole playbook that he had with Kirk Cousins, which did include some rollouts yeah. and did include him getting outside the pocket on some boots. But I did not expect him to be like, all right, here we go. We're just going to scrap all that, and we're going to go 60%, cut the field in half, and do all these outside-the-pocket type stuff because – as a defensive play caller, you can start devising some nickel blitzes and some, some outside of the, the core type of pressures to take some of that stuff away. So it's not like the defense is not going to adjust as well. So I don't expect to be a wholesale shift in this outside-the-pocket throw scheme. But you, we all did expect there to be more of it and uh, utilizing him in a scramble capacity, extending plays, and if the, the primary routes break down, then he could buy some time and get the ball down the field. I think everybody was expecting that. And so, so to not see that, I think, was surprising. And I will say this about what you, what you alluded to earlier. It, we, can, we can look at the poor performance of Dobbs, and then you can have this discussion. Well, was it play calling? Yeah. Or was it Dobbs himself? Look at the touchdown throw that he threw to Hawkinson. That was a great play. Mm-hmm. It was it was a great design. It was well coached. He he takes the snap. He looks to the right. You can see him going through his reads. He went one two and snapped right back to the center of the field and hit Hawkinson, who's coming out of his break. That's you got to if you're going to give uh, if you're going to give credit where credit is due. That's a great play call and it was a great execution. So you know when things go bad, you just can't always blame it on one person or one thing. No, I I think it's uh, it's generally a combination, and that was a good play. There weren't enough of them. You know, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. Justin Fields had a nice downfield pass late that that won the game basically because it set up the field goal. But I didn't see quite enough of that from him. Now they were trying to do something very different. 
uh, throwing sideways, um, I think about a dozen times, and 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 for uh, reasons that I understand in in theory, but not so much the way it played out. Um, the the larger question becomes, where do we go from here at the quarterback position? So we now have two weeks. The head coach says he's going to mull it over. I know some of the Jackals believe a decision's already been made that it's less likely. Uh, that it, it, it's fairly likely that Dobbs will not start the next game. I'm curious to get your view on that. Who you think will start in two weeks against the Raiders and who you think should start against the Raiders? <laughs> well, I know that Nick Mullins was still injured in that Atlanta game, which is why we saw Jaron Hall. We, we sort of know what we're going to get out of Mullen, sort of. You know, we haven't seen a, a, a lot from him in this particular offense outside of the preseason. So I'm, there's a, certainly a curiosity there. But with Jaron Hall, I don't know about you guys, but I sort of liked what I saw out of him. You know, I liked the fact that he looked like a, a small version of, of Russell Wilson in his prime. You know, a very athletic, much like Dobbs, can get outside the pocket and all that stuff. But at the same time, it did seem like he was going through the actual offense a little bit more with his progressions, trying to stay in the pocket, trying to hit guys on time. And you, look, you draft a guy for a reason because you think that there's, there's some talent there and you can develop these guys. I say you go with the young guy. Mm. And I think that you have, you have Mullins now as the backup and then Dobbs sort of goes to that emergency number three, at least for one game, and just to see what it looks like. And you got to hope that, you know, you heard KOC talk about it in his presser about playing complimentary football, and he understands a little bit more now that the defense might have to carry this team for the rest of the season, and they have to do a better job offensively of maybe being a little bit more conservative. And so if that's the approach they, they come out of at the bye, then I think that you go with the guy um, – and Jaron Hall that can give you that hand the ball off, mm-hmm. make quick decisions. You run if he has to, and he doesn't have a history of fumbling the ball or turning the ball over that Dobbs has. Yeah, I I don't know what Hall's got, and I think sometimes we there we can become prisoner to. Well, we've seen enough of Mullins, and and it's the old deal of you think of backup quarterbacks, and they don't have any warts on them because we haven't seen them. And so you want to project greatness or you, you want to project, well, why, well, you know, this guy's got a chance to be really good. But if you're asking me, you know, it's not like we've seen a bunch of Mullins, but I've seen enough to say, okay, he's pretty pedestrian to me. It, it's all a crapshoot at this point, but I would go your way. I, I would play Hall. I think Seaford thinks it's more likely that they're going to go Mullins. Not necessarily thinks that they should, but that that might be the direction they go. So I, I, it'll be very interesting to see. Because another big part of this, and I think you and I talked about this, that, that has changed with Dobbs now that he's played a little bit more is it looked to me like the Bears did a much better job of containing him outside. I think even the head coach today said, well, yeah, well when we rolled him, the problem that was happening is he wasn't just rolling with their pressure they're putting on him. He's going backwards seven or eight, nine, ten yards. And that was, that was smart uh, defensive approach. And... I thought a decent amount of zone where, or, or, or they, I don't know if they spied him, but they didn't have their backs turned. Because you mentioned, what game was it where you said, well, yeah, you, you got some good opportunities here. If people are playing man on you, you got a quarterback who can run a little bit, he's going to take advantage of that. And I, I just don't think there were as many of those opportunities because people have figured out what Dobbs can do well and where they want to make him do things he doesn't do quite as well, force him to see if he can make those other plays. Yeah, and I think when you when you look at this game, when we looked at this game as sort of a preview before the game started, you if you were probably watching the wrong film, if you didn't agree that the Bears' defensive front has gotten markedly better, yeah, that's true. With sweat with sweat being added, yep. and so you have to give them a little bit of credit too. Yes, I I agree. I think that there was when the, when the game started and the game was being played, you know, outside of the first quarter, cause they, they controlled the clock the whole first quarter. But when our offense was starting to get out there and then trying to get no rhythm, you know, their defensive front was very physical. And that's probably maybe what KOC saw as well. Sometimes like, well, you know, we have tried to get him on the edge, but instead of just rolling out in a normal arc and him feeling with, with tempo and patience, as he's just kind of getting outside the pocket, he's able to scan the field. 
he's he's escaping out of the pocket and running for his life. And it's yeah. hard for him to assess what's going on down the field and make a quality throw. So I do think there is some of that too. We got to give that Bears defense a lot of credit as well. Um, they did a lot of things uh, playing playing zone, which you know allows you to keep your eyes on the quarterback. Mm-hmm. They they sh- they sort of set a little bit deeper and just said, all right, if you're going to throw it, you're probably going to throw it right here at about the five or seven yard mark. And if you throw it any shorter, we're just going to run up and make the tackle. And and I do wonder. You go back to that first play of the game. You know, if Justin Jefferson's in there, does, yes. does he get that opportunity to go deep? Yep. You know, the uh, the other one that that JA missed on the uh, on the sideline throw, where he just couldn't quite his, quite keep his body in bounds. You know, if we complete those throws, what's the butterfly effect to that mm-hmm. to their defense? Now, do they call off the dogs a little bit? You know, do they have to honor some of that deep, those deep shots, so then those shorter intermediate routes start to work. And I mean, we'll never know, but. Um, you know, we had some missed opportunities out there. I'm having, you know, the the, the last two weeks, the defense gave up the uh, game-winning or game-losing touchdown drive to Denver and the game-losing uh, field goal drive to the Bears. But I'm having a hard time getting mad at all about the defense, Ben, because of the number of turnovers committed by this offense, the, the inexcusable number, again, the last two weeks. What, what was it? Four interceptions last night. It was uh, two fumbles and an interception last week. And I say, when you factor in how many times the defense was put in compromising positions and they handled it where they either forced the opposition to settle for three or to not get anything going, as was the case with the Bears a couple times, I, I, I can't get mad at the, 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 the defense. To me, this is all on the offense the last two weeks, especially this last game. What do you think? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I think um, we have to look at this as you, we, we know we're very frustrated as a fan base about the outcome. And we just can't all wrap it up into the same thing and say, oh, we're just frustrated with this whole team. No, we're frustrated with the offense right now, and we all understand why, because the most important position in all of sports is, is up in the air. And it's, you know, it, you know the, we're turning the ball over and all that other stuff. You look at this defense and the way they played the last several weeks, yep. and they are playing with their hair on fire. And I, I love how fast they're playing. I really enjoy our run defense right now. I always thought that was a little bit of a question mark, you know, even when the season started and into the first few games. Our blitz packages are being so much better disguised, and we're, and we're getting home with just a four-man rush at times as well. And to look back at that last play to D.J. Moore, yeah, I'm sure that internally – they don't like it. They know that there was probably a breakdown somewhere, and and who knows? Maybe it was just the perfect route and setup against that defense. Maybe they called our defense out, and they had the right the right route combination to kind of throw us off. So you have to give them a little bit of credit as well. I hope they don't beat themselves up too much about that one play, because what happens then is a defense and any offense or defense, you feel like you've got to play perfectly, and playing perfectly is never going to happen. And that's actually just going to slow you down. So I know that they're going to learn from that moment, but they need to come out this bye week playing with that intensity and playing with that hair on fire that they've been doing these last several weeks because we need them to. You know, we need we we have to have those guys playing playing fast and creating turnovers and you know Josh Mattel is you know out there like a madman just just creating yeah. so many different opportunities, so many guys stepping up. Sheldon Day in a reserve role comes in off the bench and plays really well. I mean, it, it seems like every week somebody new is sort of making a big impact. Was there any uh, disappointment? Because on that last, on the field goal drive, I don't think we uh, the Vikings blitzed much at all. I don't have this, the, the exact numbers in front of me. It looked like there were a couple plays where they did have a bunch of extra bodies at the line of scrimmage, but that they also, that they tended to retreat. Um, because, you know, that's always the complaint, is you get to that point in the game and a gambling aggressive defense suddenly decides we're going to go a little bit more passive aggressive. Were you surprised at all at that? Is there a piece of that that, that people are missing when it comes to that question in that during that series? No, I don't think so. Here's the one thing that if I'm going to really nitpick at, I noticed, and look, we have to keep Daniil out there. We, You feel like on in theory you have to keep Daniil out there. You have to keep our best pass rushers out there those guys were pretty gassed. You know, you saw them on that last play there or that, that big throw down the field. I even noticed, 
guys were kind of slow to get back to the line of scrimmage, hands on the hips, you know, all that other stuff. And I understand the pace of the game sometimes doesn't allow you to substitute. But I think in that moment, had we done it all over again, I don't really care that we're not blitzing or maybe we're not disguising a blitz. We're, we've been doing a pretty good job with just our four-man rush lately. And when those guys are fresh and they're energetic and they're ready to go, they can give a lot of offensive line problems. So I think in that moment, if I had to nitpick, I probably would have taken out some of the guys yeah. that been pass rushing for a few plays in a row and just got a fresh rotation of guys in there. But again, I, I'm, I'm nitpicking at it, and I'm not. Uh, I certainly not criticizing the lack of blitzing in those moments. Um, somebody had texted that. Well, what we needed to do um, on the play that set up the, the the pass to DJ is just let him score there. Then we might have had a chance to uh, to come back. They, that that's always the strategy people like to talk about. Just let him score, which in that moment is pretty hard. I think to project is it not about what you're supposed to do? Because obviously, effectively, the game was over because the Vikings. You know, they got the ball back with a kickoff and one goofy play. That was it. Uh, but it, it's kind of hard to sort of coach that up. Or, or, or am I wrong? The idea of, I, yeah, if, if DJ catches it at the 25, just let him go. Just ole him all the way into the end zone. Yeah, it's certainly a, situ- a situation that we do practice, but we don't practice it at that part of the field. I didn't think so, and, yes. Yeah, I normally when I've... When I've been in practice and we're doing what we called, at least in, in San Diego, we called it highway. It was this highway defense, just let the guys run on the highway, basically. We did that in the low red zone, that, that 10 yards and going in. So if we knew that they were going to try to run out the clock or whatever, and then we knew it was going to be a run play, we would basically just play dead like a bunch of possums and just open up whatever running lane it was and let them run through. But we always did that in that situation, the low red zone. But when you're in the midfield, Nobody expects there to be a deep ball down no. the middle of the field, and in that moment where you're scrambling to try to, to try to get the guy, everybody collectively just be, oh yeah, just let him go <laughs> score because this is a good strategy. No, that I, that's that's certainly armchair quarterback the next uh, day. Yeah, of the worst kind, I would say. Uh, so I keep getting texts suggesting that you have expressed on, I think, but mainly the power trip, some frustration that J.J. isn't already back. And I never know whether to trust people, you know, because sometimes they like to get me going, they like to get you going, they like to embellish. But on the other hand, I, I want to ask you, because, I mean, you know, Jefferson was out again for this game. Is there any part of you that that is disappointed that he wasn't out there for the game, uh, the Bears game last night? Yeah, for sure. I mean... There is a little bit of disappointment and, and I know what that, I know what that feels like and, and how that comes off because I don't know the extent of the injury. I'm just going off of optics mm-hmm. and, you know, optically when we all see him tweak his hamstring and, and pull it, I don't think anybody looked at us and said, Oh my gosh, that's a horrific injury. Or, you know, he had to be helped off the field and he had, or he had to be carted off or any sort of, severity that's not what we saw so in in my mind you know human nature is like okay that doesn't look too bad and i know and i've had several hamstring you know strains and pulls in my in my day and i understand that they are really hard to come back from they're very tricky they're going to feel it's going to feel 100 percent for a couple weeks but you go out there and really test in a game environment and 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 the weakness is still there and the hamstring the pain is gone and it's and it's recovering but you haven't got that elastic strength back. And so I get it. I get all that. But I do think, you know, from what we saw, you know, some of the reports of him sort of just bounding around the locker room and it seems like he was always like right there, you know, right on track to come back, you know, a couple games ago. Like, is he, is he not? I think, I think that flirtation of him coming back Mm -hmm. always just teased us that he was getting back much sooner. So yes, I'm a little frustrated that, we didn't see him out there last night, but I also get it. I also understand that you don't want to put him out there when he's not ready, when the muscle's not ready and it's not strong enough to go, to go out there and perform at his highest level. So I understand all that, but optically, for sure, a little frustrated. Uh, your uh, player of the game? So my hop splash water player of the game is a guy I mentioned just uh, a few moments ago, Sheldon Day. Yeah. You know, we could we could look at Metellus and... and um, you know, Wanham or, or Daniil, um, look, but I, I gotta, gotta tip your hat to Sheldon day for not getting a lot of game reps this season. He comes in and he's doing exactly what he was supposed to do. He, he ate up the run. 
He did a great job of penetrating when he needed to. He's a little bit of a bowling ball stature guy, but uh, that body can move and he can be disruptive. So it was nice to see him out there with fresh legs making plays for us. So, uh, you know, special tip the cap uh, to him. Are we now we get the bye, obviously, and uh, the, the team will reconvene uh, on Monday and then they uh, play the Raiders in uh, in Vegas next week. Uh, the week after, obviously. So we're back to 500, right? And so I think people were getting excited about, you know, maybe we can be the exception of the rule. As ridiculous as it is, maybe with uh, a, a QB that we got for, what was a sixth-round draft pick uh, the, that has been a, a backup guy, maybe this thing, the infrastructure's here, maybe, you know, we, maybe we can put this thing together in a way that's rarely been seen. So now I think people are trying to f- process, where are we now? Uh, now that we've lost two games in a row, both quite winnable, but we did lose them, and we lost them because of offensive issues, are we sort of back to, come on, we, we were kidding ourselves to think that this could really go someplace. W- what, what would your answer be to those who are trying to figure out how I view how they should view this team at this point as we hit the bye? Well, let's go back to that Atlanta game real quick. And I know that emotions were running high and maybe, you know, always looking at the exception. It's not always the rule, but let me just point this, this fact out. When that game was over, not only did we talk about this Dobbs game and the past or not and all this other stuff, but we also applauded and said, Hey, Kevin O'Connell needs to be at the top of the list for coach of the year. And and for what he did in that game, I think when you look at the totality of just getting the whole team ready from a, a psychological standpoint, for what he's been able to do this whole season, if you believe that he is the right coach, which I 100% agree that he's the right coach, he's done a fantastic job. Same thing with his staff. Um, Brian Flores, his defense has only gotten better. We all were just anxiously anticipating what his defense was going to look like, and now we're seeing it in full motion after this long, long season, like they're playing at a high, high level. So I have faith that we have the right coaches. Um, the defense is playing better. And we, all we have to do is just like he was saying earlier, if we can just hold on to the ball, you know, and I know that's a lot easier said than done, but if we don't have to take unnecessary risks with, with our quarterback situation, getting the ball down the field, and we can just play ball control and have our defense help us win games. And maybe we win with a low scoring output, but we still win these games. We can absolutely win with that formula and it's been proven. So I would say, um, you know, to everybody out there, just keep the faith because we have a lot of the things that you've, that we've all been begging for. We've got a great coaching staff. We've got players making plays on both sides of the ball. We have an offensive line that's rated one of the, one of the top offensive lines as far as pass protection goes in the league. A lot of these these deficiencies and, and question marks we had going this season have been answered in a positive way. So if we can just hold on the ball and um, and put a few points on the board, no doubt that we can uh, we can compete and we can compete in the playoffs. Well, to that point, let, let's finish with this nugget, which I'm sure you probably already know. I'm looking at uh, a turnover ratio, and I'm looking at the bottom of the league. Okay, Washington mm-hmm. Commanders dead last at minus. Nine. What kind of season have they had? Not very good. New England Patriots, minus eight. Minnesota Vikings, minus eight. The Raiders, minus seven. Browns, Carolina Panthers. My point is, you see, you're, you know, now that now the Chiefs are the exception. They're minus five, but they're the Chiefs, and they got you know the greatest mm-hmm. quarterback ever. But it, it, it's another reminder that if if you're going to be messing again, you're going to tempt the, the football gods with the sloppiness and the turnovers and giving up the ball as easily as they've done again the last couple of weeks, you're doomed. Especially if you're asking a backup, you know, a career backup quarterback to be the guy that leads you to the promised land. It just doesn't add up, and that that's what ap- absolutely has to be cleaned up if you're going to e- even give yourself a chip chair and a chance. No, I, I think everybody agrees with that. It, it is the obvious thing is you take care of the turnovers, you look at everything else, coaching, Offensive, defensive line. We got players. We got Justin Jefferson coming back. Hawkinson's playing at a huge high level. I think we got our, our running back situation sort of figured out as far as it's at least the tandem of guys that we're going to go with. And our defense is uh, is playing really well as, uh, along with that. I mean, look at yesterday. 
four turnovers. We had two three and outs on sudden change with the yeah. defense. They gave up one. They gave up one field goal and they had one takeaway. I mean, that is the type of ball that we're going to have to play if we want to compete. And I think these guys can do it, and they've proven they can do it. Thank you, my friend. We will chat soon. All right, appreciate it, man. Nacho Lieber, you as well, um, helping us out and flexibility from Lieber because generally he joins us on Mondays. We asked him to put that off till today, in part because we like to get his reaction to the game, but in part because we, because we'd also uh, uh, slated uh, Courtney Cronin to chat with us yesterday from the ballpark. So that worked out, I think, for everybody. Bottom of the hour, uh, we'll be back to the other, I guess, realignment radio issue we've been discussing. The Minnesota Wild and their coaching change. We'll get Luigi's reaction for the first time. He will join at about 5.30. We will, re- in the meantime, review a couple of uh, texts. To listen to the fan. Remember, if you want to chime in on what's happening with your favorite fan program, you can make your voice heard on the Bradshaw and Bryant text line. Let us know what you have to say. Text in your message to 64686. 64686, standard message and data rates apply. That's a hard game to lose, man. That really is. But they say football's a funny game. Who knew that um, this edition of Realignment Radio would have to state what is suddenly becoming the obvious? It, It sounds obvious now, but in a broader sense... It sounds preposterous. For the moment, in these uh, realignment times, where various teams are struggling, various teams are saying goodbye to old quarterbacks and old coaches, who knew that the franchise that might have to carry the day would be the Minnesota Timberwolves? Tonight... The Wolves have a showdown encounter, Western Conference encounter, that matches the number one and number two teams in the conference. The Minnesota Timberwolves and not the Denver Nuggets, the Oki City Thunder. Believe. Wolves 12 and 4, Thunder 11 and 5, top, for the moment at least. The standings in the Western Conference. They're, they're carrying the water for the entire sports community here right now. I like that package. These times of realignment. It's stunning. Now, my understanding is this is our last um, in-season tournament first-round game and that our chances of actually advancing are slim. Yes. Even though we only lost, I think we've only lost one game. We only correct? lost a sack, yeah, the other night. But there's tiebreaker issues. Um, I think we got to get some help. Golden State's playing sack. Yeah. What do we need there? We need sack to lose, I think. Here's but even I, if sack loses, I don't think we're in automatically, yeah. correct? Here's what Alan Horton tweeted out earlier today. All right. To advance out of group play, Wolves need a win tonight and then a Golden State win over Sacramento. But then he writes, but that's where things get complicated. Minnesota and Oklahoma City tips off two hours prior to Golden State sack, so the Wolves won't know what margin they'd need to win by. But it could be as many as 38 points. But it's a minimum of 21 points. <laughs> well, that's not going to be easy to do. So that would be tough yeah. against this good Oklahoma City I thought it was City as team. much as 38 we might have to win. It could be because, what about the wild card? This is just to win our division. Okay. But the wild card is an even longer I shot. See. Okay, that's I gotcha. what you're thinking about. Yeah, because Phoenix has already finished second in Group A with a three and one record and a plus thirty four point differential. Ooh. Minnesota enters the day two and one with a minus three Ooh. point differential. So we would need to win, and that's where your thirty eight yeah. points comes yeah. in. So unlikely that your dream of Timberwolves and Vikings back to back Saturday night it's disappointing and Sunday in Vegas is going to come to fruition. Doesn't seem like it at this point. But and all they had to do was beat the Kings. Like that was such yeah. an easy path. Yeah, they they had another really bad first quarter there. I think then the Kings score like forty. Well, you and know, they, and they made it a game. They they yeah. fought back to get back into it. Uh, but they they really they never could really you know I think fully challenge. Well, you know what we saw or what I thought I saw because I was there that night with my son and one of his friends. Right. 
that was the first instance this season where you start to understand the, oh, that's what they mean by playing guys off the floor. Because they were just, I mean, Cat was abusing Harrison Barnes. Couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. But on the flip side, he had to chase him around the other side. And it wasn't it wasn't like they weren't trying to chase him around. Yeah, right. It's just that's hard to do when you have both of those big guys out there. And a year ago, they they didn't have as much problem with it. They 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 won the season series against the Kings, but they were. And then De'Aaron Fox is really good too. He was hard for everybody yes, to guard. But that's also true. Anyway, that'd be a fun playoff matchup. So tonight it's the return of the local kid, correct? Chet Holmgren. Holmgren, who's been uh, very good and has become. Let me ask you a question. Has has the Wemby mania waned a little? Not that people think he's a bust or going to be, but that there's not quite as much. I can't miss a single Wemby game because the Spurs are have lost a bunch of games. They're three and fourteen. Yeah, they're a mess. They're the bottom of the conference. Whereas our guy is playing. Holmgren is playing in you know for a team that's that's off to an outstanding start. We saw a little bit. We saw glimpses glimpses of them last year about what they might have in them, um, and he has fit in very nicely, right? And he's do we call him Wemby Light? Well, I think in fairness to him, that's 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 too much of an insult. Well, I think I think he, he's just been out of sight, out of mind because he's been injured. I yeah. mean, he had an unbelievable freshman year. I but don't, I don't think people. I think people are fascinated with what he can do, but I don't think they view him. Yeah. in general, as this guy is going to change the game the way we think Wemby is. Um, on the other hand, again, his team's playing better, and he's playing. And he's a fascinating player. I'm very curious to see him in. I'm well, not in person, but on TV uh, this evening. He had 33 points last. Night. Yeah, I mean, he or no, whenever he's, they played Philly, he's playing more meaningful games right now. You could argue, but that gets back to the way the culture is set up. You know, Wemby's the guy. Everything's about Wemby. Wemby this, Wemby that. And he's international, and he's international, exotic, and maybe um, you know, uh, Holmgren saying that's fine. I'll you know I'll keep my head low and I'll just I'll just try to make a difference on a team that is in really good position near early in the season. I don't know how long it's going to last for them. I knew they, they do know they have a lot of uh, very interesting parts, but um, the odds are not good that even this early in the season, that in any season, that we'd say, well, the Wolves are carrying the day, and that's how it feels for the moment because the Vikings have dropped their second in a row, the Wild haven't won in a month. And have fired their coach. By the way, Bill Guerin joined us at three thirty. You can uh, podcast that uh, broadcast if you missed it the first time around. Because uh, as it turns out, Garzi has reminded me we are out. I thought we were going the distance today. We're out at six ten because we got to get some Vikings programming in. Is that the deal? Yep. And then the Wild. And then the Wild. Yeah, the Wild back in action tonight. So, um, and that'll be the other thing. I'll be flipping back and forth between the two. Uh, that is uh, for sure between the Wild. And the uh, and the wolves this evening, but and the Gophers uh, 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 gonna apparently start over at the quarterback position. When I say start over, that's a bit of an exaggeration because now you got the uh, portal, which means you know a lot of teams can find a QB who's got some experience, and you can at least think you can plug him in. Now, how effective he would be? That's a good question. Who that's going to be is another question. And it looks like we're going from putting all our eggs in the Cali Manis basket. To we're gonna have a lot of eggs. We're gonna so we're gonna we're gonna throw. And the the complicating factor to me is this: if you decide that that's the approach you're gonna take, out of maybe necessity, in part because you don't have a lot of nil money, does it by definition make it less likely that any of your candidates are going to be real viable, right? I guess what I'm asking is, are the most viable portal guys, guys who will only go to the to, to a program if they are pretty much guaranteed, you're the man. You're going to be our guy. There's not much negotiation about that. And the best players aren't interested in getting in, feeling like they have to get in any kind of competitions with other QBs. It, that, especially a quarterback, that's why these guys are bouncing around so much. Right. Because they just want to play and they just want to be the guy. And not all of them want to have anybody... Yeah. Staring down their neck. And that's a huge that's a huge thing at that position. And if you don't have the money, that's the other thing. If you don't have the money, yes. you gotta at least have a spot. So I don't know what they're gonna do. But it is we talked about PJ having to change, like just calling games and yes. things like that. It's gonna be fascinating because he talked a lot this year about 
you know, it's harder when you, you've got a quarterback that's young and you're invested in him and you want him to get better. That's going to pay off for the future. Well, how do you, how do you plan for the future if at the end of that, Regardless, the guy can just go, hey, I'm out. We're leaving for whatever the reason. Uh, That's going to be interesting. A couple of people have admonished us for uh, not uh, reminding people that if, it, if, we're, if we're calling ourselves realignment radio, why we haven't talked about the Twins and their realigned pitching rotation. We did talk about that yesterday. That's where this whole bit began, was yesterday. And what's been uh, fascinating is even since the start of yesterday's show, how much more realignment has been called for regarding the decision to change hockey coaches for Cali McManus to make it official that he's moving on, he's going to go someplace else, and we're looking for another quarterback as well. We did talk about the uh, the pitching rotation and that, the, in my view, the Twins are obligated to not perpetuate the nonsense that they, if they just bring back all the starting pitchers that they did from a year ago that are still with the team, that everything's going to be fine. That's a joke. No one's going to take that seriously at this point. And that means every move they make, if they're not going to spend the money in terms of free agency, every move they make has to be about concocting a trade that gives them the closest thing they can get to a towards the top end of the rotation starter. That might be a pipe dream, by the way. I'm not even sure that's possible. But that, to me, has to be their priority. If not, it's going to be impossible to take this franchise seriously. Luigi on the Wilds coaching change and who knows what else. He's next. Kick-ass offense. Three, two, now Chandler motions to the backfield. They get off the play on fourth down. Dobbs, straight drop, fires right, and it's caught by Hawkinson, who reaches the ball close to the first down. He didn't get it. Join us again for another famous moment in a... Bumper on the fan. Well, she sneaks around the world from Vienna to Carolina. She's a sticky finger filcher from Berlin down to Belize. She'll take you for a ride on a slow bus to China. Tell me where in the world is Lou Nanny. Well, he's on the phone lines is where he is. He's uh, brought to us by Kemp's, and uh, he joins us via the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. You general managers, man, it's unbelievable. You think all the problems can go away by firing the coach. Uh, how many times, how many coaches did you fire during your North Stars run? It's hard to really know because uh, some of them, like Son Moray, I had, to, I had <laughs> yeah. to relieve him and then I, I took him back. I That's him true. Back about three times, didn't That's I? That's a good I point. Mean, two yeah. for sure. You're right. But I, uh, you know, I fired Mahoney, I fired Henning. Yeah. And, uh, no, that then Glenn was back and forth a couple of times. Yeah, he doesn't count. You're right because he was. Yeah, yeah the, you were tethered to him regardless of whether you. Yeah. You fired him or not, you knew he was going to come back at some point. So uh, Everson is out, and uh, uh, John Hines is in. You know, it was I think eight days ago that he got the um, that that Everson got the, uh, the the vote of confidence on the record from Billy Guerin. We had him on at three thirty. And I asked him, you know, what changed in, in eight days. Um, is there a rule of thumb that you're supposed to wait more than eight days after you give a, a coach a vote of confidence? Is there like a minimum number of days you're supposed to wait, or does that not really matter? I don't think that that really matters. I uh, I guess the worst thing you could say is give somebody a vote of confidence because then <laughs> everybody's just waiting for yeah, you to fire the person true. after that. Yeah, how many times have they been given a vote of confidence and stayed? I know how many times they've left. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's got to be over 90%. But, uh, you know, I, I get, uh, I, you know where I get really uh, surprised is so many people quoted or, you know, writing or yeah. social media writing that, well, Billy better get this right because he fired the coach. He's next. That is so crazy. You know how many coaches Louis Lamarillo fired? Or how about Rutherford over there in Vancouver? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go down so many different teams and say, you know, just because it's it's like trading a player. You sign a player, you trade him. You sign a player, trade him. What if you if you trade three players? Now you, you're done as the general manager. You know, you, you're running an organization. You're making moves. If you're a CEO of an a big company, whatever it is. You don't think you make moves and, and uh, hires and fires in and, and key positions? That's why you're there, to make those moves. 
Yeah, it's it's true. I think the issue is you get you know, some general managers build equity because they the teams have been successful. And you say, okay, that, that that coach had his run. Time is up. Uh, there are, you know, everybody's on on a, on a shot clock, basically. Even general managers to a certain degree, but 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 coaches. And I think in some cases, it's well, if you keep making changes and nothing gets better, then at some point the owner might say, well, maybe we got to get a different guy in there to be general manager. Um, he what 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 Garen said to us was he just didn't feel like the swagger uh, the, the that that the stuff he defines as what he believes this team is capable of coming back and I'm wondering if some of that is I, I doubt any you know the coaches are ever relieved to be dismissed because it's a hard thing man it's it's got to be hard. Uh, even though these guys are very well compensated, nobody wants to be rejected that way in any shape or form. But sometimes I do wonder whether even a coach could say, man, I don't know. I've tried 15 different things here, and I'm not reaching them. Whatever whatever series of events that have put us in this place, maybe there's times where the coach himself doesn't know how to get out of it or what to do to get out of it. Well, you're exactly right, and I think that uh, first and foremost, you got to realize Dean was really, is really a, a, an excellent coach, a terrific coach. He was up for coach of the year, what, two years ago, and he should be. And he'll get another job. Sometimes it's just, it gets to a point where they're not listening to your voice. It just, if you had the same school teacher for four years, five years, and teaching all your subjects, you probably get tired, you tune the school teacher out. I know one time when, uh, I had to make a change with Glenn, and he had his, I had to go away to treatment, and I, I put Murray Oliver in. And we were going to the Stanley Cup playoffs, and Murray was a coach. And he came into my office, he said, Louis said, we're playing Toronto, we haven't been to them all year. They're not listening to me, you you got you to gotta come down to the bench. And I did. I kept him on the bench with me, I did. Mm. But he, he just felt that they weren't listening to him, they weren't hearing his voice. And And I'm telling you, if you look at, in, I'll say hockey, but I'm sure in other sports, in hockey, how many coaches stayed the whole tenure? Al Arbor. Al Arbor. The only place he coached. And he coached for many yeah. years. Other than that, even Edmonton, and there was Glenn was there, and then Muckler, then Teddy Green. Uh, yeah, Scotty Bowman went from St. Louis to Montreal to Detroit to Pittsburgh. It, it's it's a tough job. It's a tough job, especially when you're tied to the same players for a long time. And in this day and age, because of the salary cap, you don't have the movement you had before. A guy like Bill couldn't make trades like – in the past, where you might try and jolt the team by making a, a substantial trade, and you could do it, you never worried about the salary cap situation. So, you could you could trade a marquee player for another marquee player, you know, a hometown hero for somebody no one ever heard of, and, and make the deal. And, and if you go back in history, you'll see in hockey there've been an unbelievable amount of those. But that doesn't exist anymore in hockey because of that hard cap, and especially if you get too many guys on no movement clauses. That's what really, uh, yeah. you know, tied the general manager's hands. Well, to that end, and, 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 and you know, Garen was asked about this in the presser, and I got into it with him as well. Uh, the decision to, to extend on Felino, Zuccarello, and Hartman um, in September, you could argue that that did further, it does further hamstring him here now. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you, do you think, do you look at those moves as, yeah, you can make them, but it does maybe complicate things, especially if even after this coaching change, you find that you're kind of struggling or it just it ain't going to work out this season. We're going to have to you know, rethink this whole thing um, that you end up taking away needlessly some of your own flexibility. What do you think? You're, you're, you're right in that. You do take away some flexibility, but take a look at it. When you're seeing Zuccarello, he signed him for two more yeah, years. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. Page, and going two more years, that's not really tying his hands because the fact remains that if somebody's going to trade for Zuccarello, they're not going to overpay you. True. For his youth, he's already in the 35-year-old range, so that takes him off the table. 
Hartman's a good, solid player and a young player, so he got four years. And Felino, the type of player, is he got four years. I could see those two moves made, and the reason why they were made, because he's probably looking ahead at the prospects they all have in the system. They're looking to work a priest offense, and they know they got to resign him. So they want to get cost certainty around because they... They don't know where it's going to end up with uh, Kaprizov, but it's going to be in the $12 million range. So he's planning ahead and trying to fit pieces in there that he, he feels are still going to be very important to the team in, in two years and the type of player he needs. So those type of contracts didn't really tie his hands because they weren't going to make a big difference on what they're bringing to the team right now. They, they, you're, they're going to bring a comp- comparative player, but the comparative player is not going to be, uh, you know, your core piece. And I think that's the kind of thinking he was doing, making those moves. Those are key players, but when you're talking about the core players, the guys you're going to have to pay eight, nine, ten, twelve million for, that's not what they're, they're bringing back. Luigi, Lou Nanny joining us on the fan. I, I, I also, you know, one of the things I think I remember about you, because we've talked about this all long after you were general manager, is that one of the biggest challenges in the job, but perhaps one of the most important challenges, is the willingness to look at your own team and say, boys, we ain't very good. We don't have the horses. And... I might have to go to my owner and 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 tell him what he doesn't want to hear because nobody ever wants to hear. We're gonna have, maybe have to take a step back to then regroup and put ourselves at the end of that period in a better position to compete. And I asked Garen that that is this owner somebody you could say that to because everything I heard about Leopold is he doesn't want to hear that. He he wants to think every year. We're viable. Not necessarily that he, you know, he's not stupid. He knows that we're they're not on the brink of a Stanley Cup champion, but that they're going to be viable. And so I'm wondering if there's ever a time when a GM fools himself with the adrenaline rush of making a coaching change, when in fact the bigger issue is we're limited. You know, we've had we had two great regular seasons, but maybe we even overachieved to a certain extent. I heard you earlier this season. Uh, express concern about where this team really is and what they were capable of doing at this point. So is that something that you think this team should be considering through all of this, that this is more than just about a coaching change? And is it hard to do with an owner who doesn't want to hear it? Well, I think every team's always got to be concerned about where they stand and, and what their future is, what kind of moves they have to make. But it is it, uh, I can't tell you if Craig feels that way or not. It, it, it's definitely different for different individuals. Like some people don't want to hear it, and some do want to yeah. hear it. And and when we when we were in '87, '88, we had gotten slower and older, and and uh, and that's when I told Gordon Gunn, you know, uh, we got to make major moves. This, this team has got to get franchise player to sell tickets. And if I don't make any trades, you know, you, we're, we're going to miss the playoffs. And if we end up last, there are two great players out there, Modano yep. and Linden. We get one of those, it's going to be a difference maker. And if you don't care if I don't make trades or, or try and do it, then I'm not doing it. And he, and he says, well, you do what you think is best for me. I said, well, I told you it was best for you. I said, I can take the heat. <laughs> You're going to end up with Madano. It was very simple. It was just, you know, something that that you you have to you have to say you have to plan. You have to plan ahead. And when you could get a cornerstone player, and they don't come along all the time. Nope. Chicago was lucky when they got Kane. Now they got Bedard, and uh, you know they 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 went from four or five years in the basement to to winning cups with Kane, and now they're building for Bedard, and 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 sometimes. You see, you don't always get a general generational player coming along. That's the big difference. Look at Pittsburgh. Had they picked the year before, a year after, you know, there wouldn't have been a Mario Lemieux there. And and it just happens that you you can't just build through trades. You have to essentially really draft good 
players, and I think the Wild have been an exceptional job in the last two, three years, and they've got a nice cupboard coming. But it's going to take a few years for these guys to to get where their household names. And, and so, you know, you want to win along the way, but but you have to be realistic. And are you going to win? And if you do win, how far are you going to go? And I think you always have to, you always, you know, I you always have to be planning three, four years in advance because it comes quickly. Uh, Tom writes, uh, wants to know if you were ever, you were ever pressured as a GM by an owner to fire a coach when you didn't want to. No, <laughs> I, I, uh, I had no problem making the change. I had to make it, but one time they asked me to fire somebody, and, and I'm not going to say which one it was. I said no. I think he's a good coach, and then they showed me some things he had written to the owner, you know, and, and criticizing the whole operation and his, his assistants and scouting scouts and myself. I said, I'll call you back. And, a few minutes, I went down. And I fired him. That was it. Going back, I said, "We don't have that coach anymore." <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, I, I uh, no, I, 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 I really the biggest thing I ever espoused was loyalty. In fact, you know, the week before I took over, I'm playing for the North Stars. The week before I took over, Gump Worthy was the uh, scout for the North Stars, and he came in. And I'm walking out of the building, and Gump said to me, I saw the going, Gump. Oh, terrible. This guy, the general manager, is brutal. The coach is brutal. You know, we got such a bad operation here, blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to me. And I didn't say anything to him. And it was a week later that they fired everybody and hired me as general manager and coach. <laughs> and I had Gump come in. And I said, Gump, I know you and I are really close friends, and we played together you know, five years or so. I said, but you did the worst thing I can ever think of a guy doing. He said, what are you talking about? I says, I'm a player, you're in management, and you cut everybody up, upside down. I said, that's not loyalty. That's the worst thing you could ever do. I said, so I'm keeping you on, but just one time I hear you've done that to this organization, you're done. I said, you're a very good friend of mine, but I'm not going to hesitate to make the move if that's the kind of person you are, that you can stay loyal to the people you work with. How did he respond? He never, I'll tell you how he responded. There was about seven years later, uh, he was, he calls me up and he says, Louie, are we trading, I think it was Bopre. He said, no, we're not trading Bopre. Well, why are you saying that? He says, somebody told me you had a deal made for Bopre. I said, did I call you? He said, that's what I told the guy. You never do anything without calling each of us. And I said, that's right, we're not trading him. So he he understood, he got the message that, you know, we're a team, we're a team, we're a small group compared to the rest of the group, but we have to be together, and if we're not together, then you really got cracks in the foundation. Uh, tell us about, uh, give us a scouting report on John Hines in terms of style compared to Everson. What, if in a best-case scenario, what you think he might be able to uh, to represent here swooping in at this point in the season? Well, I, I don't think there's really a lot of difference in style. He's a defensive type coach. He's He's been that way all along. He's had, uh, you know, work in colleges. He, he worked for our, our USA development program before he he moved up from there and then he coached in Jersey and, and, uh, and Nashville. His, his teams have... Uh, you know, try to focus on defense. I, I mean, I, I think he was. I think his teams are pretty good with, on the power play, but he, he's uh, he, he's a thinker. He's a, a deep thinker about the game. He's, he's he's a guy that you know studies other teams and how they play and things of that sort. Now, how how he responds with the players in the locker room, I, I don't know. I've had no experience with him in that way, but he's had. Uh, He's had a you know a pretty long history uh, of games in the league. He's he's coached quite a bit in the NHL, besides everything else. So I, I think it more than style. It's going to be voice that's got to got to make a difference with this team. I think the style is going to be pretty similar, but I think the voice is is different. You know the the the, the way he's going to try and reach players. And it's, it's, and it's 
not that it's any better or, or worse right. than anybody else. It's just different. different. Yeah. Well, uh, they need something. That's for sure. Yeah, they they do. You know, hopefully, uh, the initial effect is what happens oftentimes when a new coach comes in, and for some reason or other, the team responds with a win or two, and uh, and and you want to see that because a win or two might get them to turn the corner, and, and a switch goes on, and all of a sudden, there's like some relief in in the locker room, and uh, players' uh, responses are more reactive. And, and they they have maybe an air of uh, looseness in there that they don't have right now. So uh, you know it's it's tough coming in when you when you're coming from the outside and, yeah. you, and you just come in. You got to go in and coach the team when you are, you don't even know the players' <laughs> names or numbers. He's probably been studying their uh, jersey numbers all day long, so he knows who's who. Well, the uh, I think most. Most of the time, player uh, coaches who come in in, in in a situation like this in the middle of a season, scorched earth doesn't work very well, does it? I mean, you 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 have to, I think, ease your way in. You obviously want to make a difference. You want to influence things, you know, as much as you can. But I heard him. Uh, I heard Hein. I heard him today. Hein say, you know, it's more tweaking, and I think it is that, isn't it? I mean, I think. At least you got to get your bearings right. Maybe you do go scorched earth eventually if you if you're here a few weeks and say, "Well, this is intolerable." I mean, we're we're not getting effort. I'm not getting this. I I didn't realize how bad this was, but I I think you got to give that part of it a little bit of time. And if there's an immediate switch, it's just you hope, like you say, the players. It's just a different vibe because you got a different voice. Well, that, that's well put because if he came in with just scorched earth off the bat, then. He's in real danger of getting nothing out of him the rest of the way. He, you've you've got to you've got to build a rapport with the players. You, you know what's very important right now. I think he's extremely lucky to have Darby Hendrickson there on the bench because if that were me going into this situation, I'd be leaning on Darby a lot because he can tell you so much about the players, their tendencies, their weaknesses, um, how they like to be handled. You know what they might respond to. You you have to you have to get any kind of good, valuable information derived from anywhere you can. And what's better than being close to the guys like Darby's been on that bench and knows them extremely well. And I think that's a, that could be a big benefit to him. And then he's got to, he's, he's got to let his personality win the guys over. He, he's got to handle them honestly, genuinely. And, uh, you know, be up front to the, the guys. As long as they know that they're getting the true story and, and the coach is trying to get them better by doing the things he has to do without... You know, In this day and age, you're not going to intimidate these players because yeah. they all got long contracts <laughs> or at the worst, they, you can... You can go play for somebody else. You know, it's not like <laughs> if I can't play here, I'm going to be in the minors for these guys. I'll be in some other team. You don't. You don't have the the freedom to move players like they did in the old days with no waivers, send them up and down like a toilet seat, and <laughs> not care what happened to them. You know. Uh, I didn't think you could. If you were in tropical spots, you could get a cold. Sounds like you got a little bit of a cold. I mean, with I got it, and I got it when I was leaving Minnesota on Saturday. I woke up in the Boom. morning and had See? a real sore throat, and had no chance to get over and get some medicine. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, get better, and uh, we will. Uh, we appreciate the conversation as always, and we will uh, chat next week. Okay, my friend. Thank nice you, Lou. Always Thanks. a pleasure. That is Lou Nanny. Brought to you by Kemp's. On a very busy couple of days in the hockey community, in the state of hockey. One coach out, a new coach is in, and uh, will be coaching your Minnesota Wild tonight right here on The Fan. In fact, uh, what, that's one of the reasons we're out early, because we've got to get some Vikings programming in as well. Uh, let's wrap up when we come back. We have a good opportunity to get into some more Vikings stuff from uh, leftover stuff from uh, last night. And um, even, I guess, my continued bewilderment by the reaction from some of the rubes out there to what went wrong last night. And now, famous moments in a kick-ass offense. Receivers left and right, Jordan Addison in motion behind Dobbs, who's under center, play action on first down. Josh steps up in the pocket, he dials up a deep shot, Jordan Addison uncovered, and he's out of bounds at the 
10-yard line. Addison was uncovered, and the ball sailed just enough over his head for him to be out of bounds, or else that's a cinch 48-yard touchdown. Join us again for another famous moment in 